this story uh, begins and ends with the um, development of the European Union's program for uh, uh, forest law enforcement development and trade, also known as FLEGT. Uh, and um, uh, just to give a little bit of background so that everyone's on the same page, FLEGT is mainly composed of uh, three instruments. Uh, there's the um, Voluntary Partnership Agreement, which is uh, uh, basically a trade uh, treaty between uh, European Union and timber producing, uh, uh, partner timber producing countries. Um, there's the uh, European, uh, the EU Timber Regulation, which uh, was uh, implemented in 2013. And that effectively bans the imports of illegal timber from around the world into the EU and requires due, due diligence on the part of all timber importers to know where and how their timber is, uh, was sourced and how it was traded. Uh, and finally, there's something called the VPA license, the Voluntary Partnership Agreement license, which is a mechanism developed at the national level in VPA partner countries, timber producing countries, that uh, basically show, uh, attests to the legality of timber that is exported from those countries to the EU. And um, uh, uh, for a number of years prior to all of this and, and still, still ongoing, uh, C4 colleagues have been studying uh, small-scale domestic timber markets around the world and, and the, you know, the economic and the environmental aspects of those markets. Uh, small-scale timber markets in uh, developing countries especially, but also in, uh, around the world, are often un unregulated. Um, they, they, they've operated traditionally in legal gray areas uh, or under customary systems of access and trade. Um, and they're important to the livelihoods of millions of people in tropical timber producing countries. Um, now, it's true that some timber, and in some cases even a lot of timber, um, from small-scale domestic markets finds its way into the international market. Um, in some countries, um, for example, mainland Chinese buyers are particularly active in accessing those domestic markets and exporting timber uh, internationally. Um, uh, but um, um, for this reason, uh, in, in designing the FLEGT, system and VPA processes, uh, uh, at some point it became a, pr a, a priority to include small-scale domestic timber markets within VPA agreements. And that effectively requires that at the national level, uh, timber producing countries can uh, verify the legality of all the timber traded domestically, not only exported um, to the EU and other places. And this is relevant in five out of six of the countries um, that have signed VPA so far, um, including Indonesia and four countries, or two countries in uh, West Africa and two countries in Central Africa. And there are a number of other countries that are currently still in the negotiation process and in which this particular aspect of the VPA may become, may become relevant in the future. And um, so, so to understand the potential advantages um, and some of the drawbacks of this effective formalization process of mostly informal or customary timber markets. Um, we commissioned case studies on formalization more generally across um, uh, different sectors, including uh, formalization processes uh, uh, over land, uh, land tenure, um, for the reason that land, ten land, is the, land tenure is the foundation of resource access for all land-based resources. Um, and also other, other sectors such as uh, mining, fisheries, and non-timber forest products. And uh, this led eventually to the, to the uh, publication of this special issue, which I take the opportunity of announcing today. Uh, published in Society and Natural Resources May, in May this, this year. And um, I want to just bring a few insights from that special issue, um, starting with, I think, just a quick definition of formalization. The authors of the special issue took formalization to mean inscription of uh, practices and, uh, and behaviors um, in uh, legal legal codes, national legal codes, generally 
by the state, um, by state legislature or um, lawmaking um, bodies. And um, to understand formalization, you first need to understand what the informal sector is. And that term became uh, common, especially in the, starting in the 1970s, uh, and was adopted by, initially by the International Labor Organization uh, in their work to, first of all, understand how important under the radar, unregulated economic activity is to poor people uh, in, uh, mostly in cities, in urban areas, uh, in developing countries. Uh, and um, later, it, it, it became, it's become a subject for study in natural resource sectors uh, as well. And um, a lot of initial work was done on how to make the informal sector more profitable, to protect the informal sector and its values so that, uh, to, 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 so that it could contribute, con continue contributing to poverty alleviation. And in some cases, that meant granting legal rights, so codifying or formalizing um, legal rights of uh, ownership and access to land and, and other, other processes of, uh, of business and, and trade. Um, formalization has also been used increasingly for environmental pur purposes um, to prevent unregulated extraction of natural resources that have undesirable environmental effects and also for conflict prevention as in the case of conflict m minerals in uh, in, uh, in some countries in Central Africa, West Africa, and, and uh, Southern Africa, for most notably. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's important to note that implementation or uh, sort of um, institution and implementation does not necessarily equal adoption. Um, and there are different theories about how people take on new policies and, and make them work on the ground. Um, based on their own values, beliefs, and norms. Um, but from, this, from the studies that we've done, we've, we can say that we, across the board, it's very important to know, it's very important who uh, initiates formalization, for whom, for what reason, and the order in which those processes are carried out, so when. Um, so, so some earlier work by um, um, Tor Benjaminson, a human geographer who worked on formalization of land tenure in West Africa, made the point that if you're going to formalize land tenure, um, you want to do it in such a way that, the, that local farmers who already are holding land have first dibs on, on, on getting title so that people don't come in from outside and grab all the titles and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and manage to get a hold of all the land that the pro policies you know, the policy is targeting um, uh, development for, for poor people, so you don't want to have um, the most privileged people in the area come in and take advantage of those policies first. So timing is really important. Um, it's also important to know whether policies are coming, are, are designed and implemented from the top down or from the bottom up. Um, one, of our, one of the author, authors in this issue, David McGrath, um, led, a, led, a, led a study on, on fisheries in Brazil, and, and, he, and he described um, how l the process was largely initiated by local people who wanted uh, more sustainable management of their resources and notably wanted to keep outsiders from coming in and, 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 and taking their fish. So they, 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 they pushed um, a lot uh, and, and, and pushed the state to implement policies and to tie those policies into um, uh, systems of social welfare, pension systems, etc. And um, while it's not entirely successful, in large part due to the complexity of governing access in this complex environment, um, uh, there is at least a fair amount of local buy-in um, and support. But a number of the a number of the other case studies bring bring lessons about how top-down policies can can sometimes go astray and. Uh, um, it's important to look at these and to try to predict when these things might happen or to avoid, um, um, avoid these, these potential negative effects. One of them is that when the new policy comes in and before it's actually implemented, um, you can have something called a race for the resource when everybody rushes in to try to get as much as they can before the policy is actually enforced and then you have increased environmental damage during that period. Um, another pr 
real danger is the criminalization of people who are already, who have been active in the sector for a very long time and have established um, practices and, all, and, and depend on these sectors for their livelihoods. And this is something that was seen um, in, the, in a case on mining in Zimbabwe where policies changed back and forth and eventually a lot of people ended up in jail who, who, who had formerly been targeted for uh, par poverty alleviation, um, uh, by poverty, poverty alleviation programs in the mining sector. Um, and one, another very common case is, is uh, elite capture, which is uh, when, as mentioned with the, in the case of land, to avoid, um, uh, when social groups, local social groups with more power manage to take advantage of the existing, uh, of, the, of the new policy to gain control of resources. This is the case that was described in uh, the timber sector in Indonesia in our set of studies. And uh, also, often there are very powerful criminal networks that are able to take advantage of the system uh, and, uh, um, and sort of avoid enforcement um, while local resource owners are pushed out of the market. Um, and finally, um, if in a case of, of, of uh, of uh, application of higher level policies over many countries, there's a danger of leakage of the unintended or the, uh, uh, the, the negative effects from one country to another. So this was, this was something described in the case uh, uh, in the Southern African case uh, uh, on natural uh, non-timber forest products where very lucrative um, products could be accessed in one country, in, in, in more than one country. So implementation of a, a, a more restrictive policy in one country would, would result in over-extraction in another neighboring country. Um, so uh, what to do about all this? Um, just to give an example, our, one of our, our leading uh, experts on, on <coughs> Indonesian timber, timber policy, Christoph Obedzinski, um, is working in, um, in, in, in East Kalimantan at a lower um, political scale to try to understand how with under the Indonesian VPA um, more local level um, uh, rules need to be worked out. Because often the problem is that rules are initially uh, applied at a very high level and are not necessarily relevant uh, or useful to local people. So, so uh, he and his colleagues are working uh, in East Kalimantan to understand how rules could be developed that allow for small-scale small scale logging and small-scale trading in timber for, for local markets. Um, and um, at a more general level, we make a, a broad recommendation that uh, in, 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 in reviewing the work that's already been done under the FLEGT VPA process, that, um, uh, that the efforts make a, a more of an effort to understand local and customary institutions. Um, when looking at how to regulate domestic timber access and trade. Um, these, are, the, these have largely been overlooked so far because they, on the surface, are quite complicated, too hard to understand uh, at the national or international level, but it's still very important if you want these <coughs> things to work. Um, and uh, finally, um, we, we, we recommend that after, you know, post-VPA, after this whole process is over, that, um, uh, that the, the, uh, the implementers, the, especially the EC, think about um, how to implement a user accountable monitoring system. So to understand the effects after the policies are implemented. And not just the effects on, uh, on timber and the timber trade and, and whether um, uh, less illegal timber is entering the EU, but on how local institutions are, are, are responding to the international policies and the national rules and how um, local customary users are experiencing change in, their, in, in the uh, economic sectors in, on which they, de they depend for their livelihoods. Uh, so um, meanwhile, we're working to get the word out. Uh, and um, I want to thank you all for coming to listen to um, this brief talk today. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. That was great. Um, and of course, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Do you want to feed them, or should I feel them? Uh, you can if you don't mind. All right.
Robert? Uh, maybe Oh, um, oh, sorry. Maybe it's just a really little tiny point, but it, your very last one, um, you were saying that um, among your recommendations was that after the VPA process was complete, you would uh, like to encourage <coughs> the EU to implement, uh, if I got this right, a, a user implemented monitoring system. Could you clarify a little? Because I thought okay. the VPA was a monitoring system of sorts. Well, the, the VPA is a system for um, assuring timber legality. So there is, there, there is a requirement to monitor um, access and trade in timber. Um, by, by user accountable monitoring, monitor, monitoring system, I meant more of a, a monitoring system that also looks at the social effects of, of the VPAs as well as, as well as the environmental outcomes. Um, and this is drawing from recommendations by, made by Eleanor Ostrom in 1999 in her design principles um, on uh, uh, sustainable management and sustainable governance of, uh, of the commons. Um, so the idea is that uh, over time you need to have systems that, uh, that are accountable to the users of the resources and also preferably involve those Representative, representative of those users or community groups in monitoring, um, monitoring processes. Yeah. Thanks. Jacob? Thanks, Louis. Uh, yeah. Kind of following up on that, I'm wondering, are there any social safeguards or even kind of socially oriented or equity oriented principles integrated into the VPA? I'm thinking akin yeah. to what we've seen emerge from the Red Plus sector? You know, very much so. Um, uh, and the most obvious level at which that, that is the case is that most of the national forestry laws, all of the national forestry laws in the countries that have signed VPAs contain social safeguards. So the first, the first um, uh, uh, level of application is at the most simplest level um, that all logging and trade in timber has to respect national laws which generally have fairly well articulated social safeguards, whether or not those are um, implemented um, to the point where they actually um, help people. Um, but um, yeah. I just want to read one more quote from the EC, because in, in 2012, they issued a publication on this whole process. And, and they said that forests are a component of a system along with people, um, their institutions and policies climate, markets, and a host of other variables. When one component of the system is changed, the full effect is mainly unforeseen, and there are significant impacts on other parts of the system. So all of the work that we did um, both reinforces that and, and further um, sort of describes that the complicated nature of this and the interactions between the legal systems and social systems and, and social welfare. Hi, Louis. Hi. Um, I, I want to go to your, one of the other recommendations you made, which was um, trying to understand more the local context. Um, can you just give an example of how that would have helped? Because you also mentioned it's really difficult, and <coughs> it might be, you know, might be difficult to start. But maybe an example of how that can be useful. Yeah. Well, to some degree, I think it's it's. It's self-obvious that um, in places where resource access and trade have been largely unregulated but very, very um, busy, um, that um, in making, in, in codifying rules, you would need to understand those uh, existing practices and, and, uh, and um, and how they're set up, and what you know, how people interact with each other, how, what kinds of struct social structures, local social structures, are there that govern mm -hmm. who gets to go where and acts and take what, and and uh, there are there are such systems everywhere we work um, in tropical forest areas um, at lower levels than even than than even local district county mm -hmm. level. Um, and the, you know, initially, uh, when the when the process of of 
re, of, of, of designing the VPAs was going on, the, there was a plan to review all existing nas relevant national policies and laws uh, governing forests, including customary laws. And in the process of the, those reviews were done, but in the process, um, they didn't manage to get to customary. And you know, one of the reasons for that is probably that customary law is highly variable from mm -hmm. place to place. So when you're working between the international level and the national level, um, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not such an easy thing to address customary mm -hmm. laws, which could be very local. And there can be hundreds of different systems in a, in a given country. So how do you, this is where you get into the questions of how do you implement an international regime um, while um, uh, integrating bottom-up processes. And that's a challenge that, uh, that isn't, hasn't been worked out very well um, so far. Karen? Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering whether any of the case studies had looked at the impacts of uh, governmental decentralization um, and whether that has any, any correlation with a more uh, <coughs> egalitarian or more sensitive uh, approach to VPA. <coughs> Not necessarily well, yes decentralized no. natural resource management. The particularly the case on Zimbabwe focus, you know, discussed decentralization. Um, this was by Sam Spiegel, who's, uh, who's both an Indonesianist and, uh, and uh, an expert in small-scale mining and, has also, and also works a lot in Southern <coughs> Africa. He, um, he found, he, 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 he described a process of, of um, decentralization followed by a process of recentralization mm -hmm. in which um, the decentralization uh, uh, largely was seen as uh, beneficial to the small scale mining communities that, he, that, uh, that were the sort of the targets of international development agencies at that time and and small the the the, the uh, it, sort of the the formalization of their rights at that time you know prior to um, the recentralization in the 2000s um, was uh, was seen was 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 seen very favor favorably by international development institutions people did well out of it they they were better off but that followed that that was followed by a wave of recentralization and you know this the, the, these these recentralization can also be stimulated by um, by uh, in, global institutional development processes mm -hmm. so if you want to better regulate a sector mm -hmm. such as the timber sector or uh, you want to prevent illegality, et cetera. Sometimes the first thing that happens is actually a big recentralization. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. some extent, that's also a potential outcome of FLEG, the FLEG TVPA process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the case of mining, that recentralization resulted in what I mentioned during the talk um, a huge wave of criminalization of small scale actors who formerly were sort of the beneficiaries of national decentralization policies. If I may add to that, in my work too, it's like the decentralization policies in Colombia, a large scale in an area, led to a massive influx of the state. And the legalization of land title was followed pretty much immediately by the entry of lots of illegal and paralegal actors. So what was supposed to be a poverty alleviation development strategy through formal you know, land tenure led to massive displacement and, and illegal actors and the state paradoxically being deeply entrenched in a region. Uh, Dede and uh, thank you, Louis. Uh, I think I would like to add uh, some comments, in particular your statements. And I think uh, the common problem is when we are translating the international idea into local context, then we, we will find some drawbacks. I would like to give example from the timber certification cases. For example, in Indonesia, uh, my study found that on this small amount of certified timber that can be uh, entered into European market, 
but still maybe about 90% or more still can find another market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's one point. And the other point, most of the timber that comply with the certification, in fact, they are the planted coming from smallholders, which is not really relevant with illegality. So I think that's the second drawback. So I think uh, we need to address this kind of uh, issues yeah, when we are trying to broad uh, the broader scale of these ideas. But we have to be careful because it will uh, provide a lot of incentive, disincentive to smallholders. Uh, small yeah. Thank you. I totally agree. Christopher. Thanks, Louis, for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, not a question, just a general comment. Uh, that I think it seems to me that you know these lessons from formalization and you know uh, in, in these different sectors that, that you describe in in the uh, in the special issue, it seems to me that they, this, this has a, uh, is of, is of particular value. I think. Um, Right now, uh, if we look uh, for, for, for changes that are happening in other sectors, you know, we, we didn't consider, for example, oil palm in our special issue, but it seems to me that these lessons with formula formalizing timber and other things uh, are of particular relevance to, to the challenges with formalizing that, for example, oil palm is going to face uh, as, as this idea of zero deforestation and, and so on kind of gets get you know get, puts a root in um, in the sector so it seems to me that your your special issue has a, a lot to contribute in that area uh, i don't know if you want to comment on that well our special issue and and i think your comments quite relevant i mean this is just the beginning there's men, a lot more work that can be done so let's do another one mm -hmm. <laughs> anymore It's a matter of term or terminology. You describe very well about formalization. I have difficulty in understanding the term socialization. Is it going to be a formal academic term? I, I heard it, you know, over spoken from time to time in many different events, especially in Indonesia. Thanks. Okay, I, I, I didn't use that term, but um, I'll venture to say that it has to do with um, it's vulgarization, popularization, um, rolling out, upscaling um, on what that, those, those are potential definitions of that, I would imagine. So uh, are those, the, is, the, is that the context in which it's being used in the case of, in the case here? Well, I, I, th I think that, um, um, uh, you can use the term socialization um, um, for what it means on face value. Um, uh, and uh, to me, it would mean um, popularization generally, mm -hmm. rolling out, upscaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that um, there are many different potential definitions. I don't think it's complete. It's not uncommon. I didn't, we didn't use it. <laughs> I, I just had a background question. Um, so how important is the EC for, for the market in these countries? And to, <clears throat> it seemed to me that you were also insinuating that perhaps they had an influence on national policies as well. Was that really the case? And is the, is the concern how to incorporate smallholders or how to ensure that smallholders benefit? Or, you know, are there, like what Padade said, there are other markets that they can still be absorbed in? You know, how, right. how important of a player is the EC? Okay, well, that's uh, the first question. It's, um, it's an important player in the world timber, in, in the world timber markets and markets for all natural resources. It's a big, EU is a big consumer. Um, now, one of the questions has been, is it the, you know, if, if other major markets do not um, comply in a similar way to, the, to, to, a, to a comparable system, then does it, how much does it matter? But at some of those other markets, for example, include China, which also exports a lot of the timber that they import 
in the form of final products to the EU. Mm -hmm. So overall, it's it's you know it's an important segment of the global of the global market. So it, it does it does matter to um, timber producing countries what the EU um, does in terms of regulating its own imports. Now, when it comes to um, uh, uh, how the you know the VPA process, whether, whether the VPA process affects domestic timber policy, absolutely, if, if it's implemented as promised, mm. um, it requires um, designing whole new systems of uh, timber legality verification, or at least adapting or uh, proving existing systems of timber legality verification. Um, and uh, and as, as, as um, and as regards small-scale operators, smallholders, etc., uh, in the case of some countries, it requires the formalization of domestic timber markets. So it has a big effect on how um, smallholders are able to access the market, even within their own country. So, so uh, it's it's potentially a very powerful and very important um, um, global uh, forest governance and trade regime. I'm going to put in one more question, piggybacking sort of on Bimbika's, but also touching on uh, part of the paper which you haven't spoken about. Um, you were talking about some of the unintended consequences for smallholders, and I think in some of your other work, as well as in this paper, you mentioned how these formalization procedures have negative impacts on marginalized communities and on women uh, timber producers. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, there's specific, there was a specific case in one of the case studies um, that was done um, by our Southern Africa colleagues where um, the formalization process of the, it was actually the baobab bark industry, um, just to give an example, um, uh, which is largely, uh, was largely um, um, managed and run by women. Um, required that uh, the, that producers that traders um, interact more with law enforcement, um, with with officials, law, law, police, and and border guards, etc. And and this put women um, traders in contact with um, with um, m with male authorities, and uh, this was an an unintended negative outcome of this was that. Uh, uh, that um, it became um, intimidating or dangerous for women to be involved in, the, in, 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 in certain parts of the value chain that they'd been involved with before. So they lost out on some, some economic, I mean, there were, there's to some degree a, a major effect on, on, on women yeah, in, that, in that particular sector. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Christine? Thanks. I just generally wanted to ask a bit sort of, of um, referring to uh, Dede's question. How much do you think of the issues, um, the problems also stem from a real lack of knowledge of how many, you know, what the processes are of production of many of these, many of these products, whether of timber, you know, looking at the kinds of things that Peter and other people look at where a lot of timber is actually more of an agricultural product than it is than it is a forest product. And I would think in other areas as well that even though there may be such a focus on rights and on legality that essentially we don't understand what the product is at all. We don't understand what is, you know, what we're talking about, what this timber is or what these these non-timber products may be or whatever where they're far more planted, far more managed, far more sort of cultural products than they are natural products. Do you think that's a broad sort of, of um, issue or is that just happened no, to be one of my yeah. obsessions? <laughs> well, I think it's a, a huge issue and um, um, I think that a lot of us here are, are, are sharing your interest in, in, in understanding it. I, I th and, and I think that uh, um, 
that means that, you know, what that means is that uh, there's still a huge need for basic research into how local people access and manage resources and what are the, what are the, um, uh, what are the very specific processes through which they do that. And in forestry, obviously, it, it, in, it requires understanding um, social organization in local places. It, under, it, it, it requires understanding ecology, um, uh, um, you know, the biological processes whereby small holders or, or local people in general are able to um, take advantage of specific ecological niches to produce, to sustainably produce uh, timber um, in, their, in, in a huge range of very specific local eco, ecological niches. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that that's a, a very good point and something that we need to, to do a lot more work on, keep doing a lot of work on. Yeah. Any last question? Well, Louis, thank you so much, and thank you all for the excellent questions. Clearly, we're not done discussing the topic, so we look forward to other sciences tens and other conversations formally and informally. Thank you. Thank you.